welcome to episode 31 of Ping, a Firewalls.com podcast, a bi-weekly look at cybersecurity, including interviews, news, expert tips, and the latest trends. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my Firewalls.com colleague, Andrew Harmon. Hey there. Hey, Andrew. As we tackle a different featured topic each episode, new episodes are normally out every other Wednesday, but we're cheating this week and dropping this one on a Friday. All the better reason to subscribe or follow on your favorite podcasting platform to get our latest first. Please do rate and review us, or you can drop us a line anytime at podcast at firewalls.com. As always, thanks for listening, and now it's time to introduce our featured topic and our guest for this episode. October is known for Halloween, pumpkin patches, fall foliage, and more, but for the last 17 years, it's also been known as the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And as we routinely say on Ping, awareness is a key part of any defense strategy against cyber threats, and there are plenty to be aware of in 2020. To discuss this iteration of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, along with a number of resources to help keep individuals and organizations protected in the new age of remote work, we welcome James Stanley, Product Development Team Lead, Cybersecurity Division of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. James, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. Glad to be here. So before we get rolling with the rest of the questions that we have, I always like to take a moment to get a little bit of an idea of uh, what our guest does on a day-to-day basis. So tell us what your day is like typically. Sure. So I've been here for a couple of years now. I started off as a network analyst. So I was digging into the, the big data coming from our sensors that are placed in front of all our federal agencies. And then after a few years of doing that, we kind of realized as an agency, I think that we wanted to get the word out more about what we were seeing. That was a little bit of a shortcoming that we had, and so we decided to put together something, a small team right now, that's the product development team inside the operational collaboration division in our cybersecurity division. And part of my job on a daily basis is to work with our other divisions and our technical analysts to look for trending data or maybe a new critical vulnerability that we're seeing exploited based on the detection mechanisms that we have in place and start to share that information with the general public, whether it be through reports that go out on our website, or if it's a little bit more information that we need to keep more close hold, we'll put it out to our key stakeholders at a different level of classification using the traffic light protocol. Interesting. So as we mentioned in the intro, we are now in the 17th year with October as the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Why do we have a month built around online security? Why is that so important? That's a great question. I think at this point, the threats we face in cyberspace are more complex. The actor is more diverse than at any point in our history. So we're, CISA is asking for Americans to join in the collective defense against these threats to understand and manage our risk to critical infrastructure. Specifically this year, forever changed the way we work, learn, and socialize, driving these activities more and more online. That means that not only our businesses online with proprietary information, but also at our homes, schools, we're more connected than ever. That focuses on the importance of cybersecurity and setting up good cyber habits, not to mention building a culture of cybersecurity in your homes and workplaces helps carry the conversation all year round. So a uh, point of emphasis in this year's uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is if you connect it, protect it. So explain a little bit about what that means and why there may be some connected devices people don't necessarily associate with security. People need to realize that all internet connected devices are potentially vulnerable. And this campaign emphasizes that if you do connect it to the internet, then you need to protect it. So protecting against cyber threats is the critical challenge for individuals and organizations of all sizes, both public and private sectors. Cybersecurity Awareness Month reminds us that online security is a shared responsibility and creating a safer cyber environment requires engagement from the entire community. Not to mention, there are currently 4.8 billion estimated internet users. So that's over 62% of the world's population. And a lot of people don't realize that when you're connecting things online, that people are looking for that. So you need to be aware, whether it's home setups, like ring doorbells, whether it's logging in through a VPN device to access your work computer and your work information from home, all of this stuff needs to be taken care of. 
Right, and so I imagine with these connected devices, a lot of the times we're talking about the Internet of Things, where perhaps security isn't always top of mind for the manufacturers, and so there is kind of a bit more of an additional onus on users to play their part, and that's part of the overarching theme of 2020's Cyber Awareness Month is do your part, be cyber smart. So what is this personal accountability and cybersecurity all about, and why is it especially important now? I think right now, as we're seeing the shift to working from home has really kind of gathered everyone's attention. A lot of people didn't realize that a lot of what they're doing from their jobs, that was vulnerable. And I think they're starting to realize that now as we make this shift, and the shift is going to be more of a permanent thing. So our agency is pushing towards getting to every American user, not just the IT professionals or the people that are in the cyberspace working on it day to day but just your average home user and encouraging they take the proactive steps to enable lasting positive cybersecurity behavior at home, school, and work. And so speaking of the at home and at work in particular situation, and of course, I mean, school is remote now too. This personal accountability side of things is is talking about telework being one of the main issues. And so what are some key factors that uh, people working from home or taking classes from home, what should they be considering when it comes to security? Sure. So that's a great question. We actually prioritize within CISA early on when the COVID pandemic happened and when we started moving everything to more of a telework posture. So we came together as an organization and we developed and released the Telework Essentials Toolkit, which has a lot of these answers. For this podcast and for this time, a lot of what people from home can do is take proper steps to configure and harden, simply put. So some of those things is you can ensure your home network is properly configured, change all default passwords, and use strong, complex passwords. Generally, rule of thumb for passwords is the longer, the better. Ensure your home wireless router is configured to use WPA2 or WPA3 wireless encryption standard and disable legacy protocols such as WEP or WPA. There are a lot of risks to your wireless router. Whether it's home or business, the risks to an unsecured router are the same. So some of those, they include piggybacking. So if you fail to secure your router, anyone with a wireless enabled computer in range can access your wireless point and use your connection. This might be people driving by in the neighborhood that can just park around the corner from your house that you don't notice, and they can get onto your wireless connection if it's not properly configured and hardened. We are also warning people about war driving. That's a specific kind of piggybacking when the broadcast range of a wireless access point can make internet connections available outside your home, even as far as your street. So savvy users know this, and they have made a hobby out of driving through cities and neighborhoods with a wireless and equipped computer, sometimes with a long antenna that can reach houses much farther away than what you'd expect them to. There's a couple others, such as rogue hotspots or evil twin attacks, where adversaries gather information about a public network access point and they set up their systems to impersonate it. So the adversary can use a broadcast signal stronger than the one generated by legitimate access point, then unsuspecting users connect using stronger signals. We are also warning about wireless sniffing. So many public access points are not secured and the traffic they carry is not encrypted. So this can put your sensitive communications or transactions at risk. So this is a key one when people need some quiet space, maybe away from their kids at home and they head over to the coffee house down the street. That is not a secured wireless access point. So you really need to be aware of that. And ideally, you would have multi-factor authentication required when you're logging into your work computer and accessing your work environment. But a lot of times it's it's not the case. And so we need the end users to be aware of that and be cognizant when they're traveling to somewhere to get their work done. Maybe that's outside of their home or even in their home. Right. And we can definitely provide a link to the work from home toolkit that you guys have published. I mean, that'll definitely equip people to make smarter decisions when teleworking. But of course, that security is a two way street. So what should businesses and organizations prioritize to balance up security and access for their remote workers? Well, for our friends in the IT department, I think there's a few topics they can consider. So Helping IT professionals develop security awareness and vigilance, ensure systems are patched and take steps to manage vulnerabilities, enable domain-based message authentication to reduce phishing attacks. And I think the biggest one that we see as an organization is patch management. So we are constantly seeing these vulnerabilities that are being exploited, specifically with VPN devices, that some organizations just fail to prioritize, and it's a massive point that we need to try to hit home whenever we can. Organizations really need to prioritize patch management, and right now that should be 
VPN devices specifically, and really anything that's internet facing. Yeah, don't, but don't also it isn't just an IT issue. I think it's a core business function. So like HR, finance, and legal departments, they have a function to help the firm provide services to clients and each has their own set of established practices. So just like other business functions, cybersecurity has its own set of established practices and resources that should be governed. So for leaders, you got to drive this cybersecurity strategy. You need to invest in assets like DMARC, vulnerability assessments, uh, and you need to build and reward a cybersecurity culture in your organization. Yeah, so speaking of that cybersecurity culture leads into uh, another question. We, we talk about all these technical things that people need to do in terms of having good cybersecurity technology in place and patching and uh, doing updates all the time and, and all that. But how important is it to make sure that an organization is training all of their employees uh, about cybersecurity and things to look for that, that may be suspicious? Yeah, so I might be a little biased uh, with this answer, but <laughs> as we mentioned before, building a culture of cybersecurity is absolutely vital to protecting the collective cybersecurity posture, and a major part of that is communicating suspicious activity. So it really falls on every organization, no matter what the organization does, how big or small they are. People are looking to exploit them, and it's, it's really quite easy compared to what some might think that aren't in the field. So it really is important that you make sure you know the procedures for communicating suspicious activities to your organization's IT security team. So promptly reporting all that, and that falls on user training and user awareness. So if you're seeing unusual or suspicious activity on any device, whether it's a computer, mobile device, even your home network, you need to ask for help because it's always better safe than sorry. So you got to contact your organization's help desk, your security operations center to report the activity. And don't click first and ask questions later. Absolutely. That is a, that is a key phrase that everyone should know. <laughs> so circling back around to this telework toolkit, I imagine there is some cybersecurity training assets to this. Could you tell us a little bit more what's in this toolkit and how it can sort of keep cybersecurity top of mind for employees and employers? Sure. So when we were addressing the toolkit and we were working to develop it, we wanted to break it down into a couple key areas. And so we did that with basically each of the three pages is geared towards one of the groups. So we have the executive leaders. So that's what, you know, the CISO levels and the higher level folks at the companies, what they need to key on, what they need to focus on. And then we brought it down to the IT professionals. So a little bit different as far as what their key responsibilities would be. And then we finished it with the home end users some more generic guidance, just kind of how to understand better, maybe broaden their knowledge, since a lot of them, they obviously don't have background in cybersecurity, and they, they might just choose to, to log in and ignore the rest. And that's, that's not the best way to go. So we tried to develop something that kind of hits home for all three of these. We worked with the Global Cyber Alliance and the Cyber Readiness Institute to provide links to just a wealth of information for each of these groups, as well as basic awareness for the end users and easy things that they can understand, develop, and put into practice for their everyday use. So in your experience, we know that a lot of people just had to swap over to some type of remote work scenario very quickly in the spring. Now that we've had several months go by, are organizations getting better about you know not only having a telework setup, but having more security and, uh, and better performance at this point? Yeah, I think so. I think it's been a while and I think organizations are quickly adapting to it because the threat is real. So when you start hearing about it in the news, hopefully you're not one that has been compromised because that would take down organ some organizations don't come back from that when there's a ransomware attack and they can't afford it. So I think what we've seen specifically in the federal space, but through the critical infrastructure partners that we work with and our, our state and local governments, We've seen a huge priority, especially when it comes to patch management and maintaining and upgrading and protecting their public facing devices, such as the VPNs that the teleworkers log in from home with. With all of this information, the telework resources, I know you have a number of other resources and toolkits on your website. We definitely want to remind people that you may be listening to this in October and that's Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but it doesn't end when October 31st hits. Absolutely. This is something that CIS as an organization wants to hit home as much as we possibly can. And it's great having a month to really raise awareness, but people need to understand that this is this is a very real threat that is only going to get bigger and only more severe with every passing year, every passing month. So we really need to come together as a collaborative group and really work together to protect ourselves. 
Well, we are certainly aware of cybersecurity this month, more so than any other, and we appreciate everything that CISA does to help spread that awareness and keep it in the public eye. And so where would you suggest people go to find some of these resources? So the first stop is definitely visiting the website. So just landing on CISA.gov, C-I-S-A.gov, will get you to a wealth of resources and potential knowledge. And then specifically for folks that are looking for help, maybe just with telework, if you go to CISA.gov forward slash telework, that can point you to a, a ton of great resources that can get you going, whether you're an IT professional that might need some help at a small organization, whether you're an executive leader who might need some, some guidance to kind of steer your organization down a new path, or whether you're that end user that just wants to kind of help out and learn more to protect themselves. All right. And as uh, Andrew said, we'll have a number of links in the description to the things that we have discussed today. James, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. It was great being here. It's time again for Ransomware Reckoning, in which our Firewalls.com colleague Andrew Nita shines a spotlight on a high-profile ransomware case, because unfortunately, there are plenty to choose from. As it often happens, cyber criminals tend to prey on the most vulnerable to inflict the most damage. In an unsettling find, we've recently seen a rise in cyber criminals attempting to infiltrate children's schools. In these events, the attackers mask themselves as a parent of a child who is desperately trying to submit an assignment. These emails seem harmless at first, but they've arrived to the teacher with malicious intent. Most messages begin with a parent having trouble submitting an assignment. Often, the claim is the online portal isn't working, or the parent can't simply figure it out. The dagger to the network is the attachment the masked attacker has in the email. The so-called assignment is actually ransomware intended to do harm to the network. Recent articles have been praising hacking groups for donating ransomware proceeds to charities and painting them as modern-day Robin Hoods. Don't let the PR fool you. Using the thirst of a child's knowledge as the Trojan horse and the well-hearted kindness of a teacher to install ransomware is now the new normal for cyber criminals. Stay tuned to the Ping Podcast for updates on ransomware all across the globe. Now it's time for headlines. In this regular segment, we take a closer look at a few top stories in the cybersecurity world and what they may mean to you. Now, headline number one, Robinhood kicks cybersecurity month off by getting hacked. So approximately 2,000 Robinhood accounts were accessed by hackers and looted during the week of October 5th or 15th, depending on uh, <laughs> the story that you saw, the beginning of the previously featured Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So either the beginning or the middle. Right. I was a bit confused about the dates there. I think perhaps Robin Hood themselves sent out a security update on October 15th in regards to the looting, which happened starting October 5th. That's how I took it, at least. But uh, mm -hmm. obviously, if you wake up to an email frantically telling you to change your password and set up 2FA, then maybe you've got a surprise that day. <laughs> yeah, and Robin Hood said that was just a coincidence that they had already planned on sending out that uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month email to uh, <laughs> make sure that people were extra secure, but it doesn't seem like a likely coincidence there. The subject line was changed to, I told you so. <laughs> So for those unfamiliar with Robinhood, it's a stock option and crypto trading platform. Uh, it's very popular, especially with beginners, as it has a pretty low threshold for getting started. So mm -hmm. anybody can really jump on and get invested in the stock market without knowing too much or having to pay too many fees or barriers uh, to deal with along the way. Yeah, it's quite popular and it's gotten even more popular during the pandemic, I think, because more people have been online more and looking for something to do or looking for a way to make a little bit more money. Also, interest rates are very, very, very low if you put your money in savings right now. So, you know, all those factors put together and Robinhood has been uh, pretty popular lately. Right. And so when you said 2000 accounts had been hacked, in many of these cases, those accounts had their funds routed to a new bank account that was added to the uh, to the user account after the breach and then had their money exfiltrated. 
do that mean? So there was uh, apparently no sort of validation process for adding new external accounts. And so uh, those transfers were able to happen without any real checks or balances to ensure they were not compromised. Yeah, we don't know exactly how much money was affected. But yeah, basically all the if someone was able to hack into an account, all they had to do was add a different account, and move the money around. If you do another like online financial transaction, typically what you'll have to do is you'll add the account, add the routing number, and then they'll verify that with maybe a two cent deposit or something like that to your account that it is your account. But I guess Robinhood does not have that particular step. So yeah, we don't know how much was taken. We do have a statement from Robin Hood that's really claiming that it wasn't their fault. Right. That quote, a limited number of customers appear to have had their Robin Hood account targeted by cyber criminals because of their personal email account, that which is associated with their Robin Hood account, being compromised outside of Robin Hood. And it says we are actively working with those impacted to secure their accounts. This was not stemming from a breach of Robin Hood's systems. Right. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, they very quickly sent out messages urging their customers to set up multi-factor or, or two-factor authentication and to work on improving their password strength. Obviously, uh, even if you get breached outside of the system, if you don't have those extra account settings, that extra protection available, then there's only so much you can do there. Yeah, I mean, a, a 2FA situation would probably have taken care of these 2,000 customers because if, in fact, people had hacked their email somehow and had their email login information, then they'd still need to have another way of verifying, which probably would not be something they'd have. I may be inclined to believe Robin Hood's explanation here just because... They have some somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 million customers, and it seems rather strange that only 2,000 would have been affected, but who knows? Right. They seem only incidentally caught up in the attack here as just sort of somebody already had that info and was looking for a way to exploit it, and Robin Hood happened to be that conduit for them. Mm -hmm. One thing that did complicate the problem on Robin Hood's side, though, is the fact that they do not have phone support available. So likely no big call center where they can take this kind of call surge. I imagine mm -hmm. if you got 2000 people frantically calling you, then you're going to need a large team of people to field those calls. But uh, apparently they have only have an online support portal. And so the response moved a bit slower than customers would like. Yeah, it doesn't even seem like they have a chat function which, uh, you know, any kind of real-time customer support would probably have addressed the issue, but it seems as if it might have been, uh, okay, we, we've reported something, now wait for 24 hours or 48 hours for a response and right. go back and forth that way. But Robinhood does say that if they determine through their investigation that the customer has sustained losses because of unauthorized activity, they will compensate the customer fully for those losses. So that's important to note, but we don't know if that determination has been made and... Uh, Again, whether anyone's been compensated right. and how much was lost. Yeah, and if they would count something like a compromised email outside of their system as unauthorized activity requiring that sort of repayment, that's still up in the air. Right. And this goes along with the security guidelines in place in general. We talked about the bank account verification, but other brokerage firms have a lot more spelled out, stringent security guidelines and account protection guarantees. They even have like special fancy names for their account protection. That was the Schwab guarantee, I believe. <laughs> uh, was there one are of a few. For Charles yeah. Schwab, yeah. <laughs> so... The fact that this is only coming out with a statement like that, and there is some nebulousness to the statement, as you said, doesn't give you complete warm fuzzies about the safety of your money. Right. And the reason so many of these other brokerage firms have these more stringent guidelines and protection guarantees is because a lot of them have already fallen victim to attacks. The financial sector has uh, been pretty well besieged by these kinds of ransomware and uh, data theft attacks. And so, you know, they've been through the ringer and they've they've got those uh, more stringent protections in place. And maybe this is Robin Hood's turn <laughs> over the barrel before they <laughs> implement their stronger security as well. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes it does take being a victim of a hack to really take your security seriously. So this article that we are working off of is from Investopedia. 
And uh, they end with a few tips for online trading. Many of them you'll find kind of familiar to some other cybersecurity tips that we share, but there are some good ones to note in here. We talked about the strong password. This one is emphasizing not to reuse passwords and use a unique hard to guess one for each account. Don't share your login credentials with anyone. Make sure you log into the secure website for the institution with the old HTTPS. All right. We got set up two-factor authentication, so Robinhood clients immediately should start following those steps. And I imagine most other financial sector platforms have a similar 2FA setup, so uh, definitely make sure you are opted into that. Use a firewall program to control the flow of traffic to your computer. Also recommended to use a VPN or, or even a hardware firewall. That might be a bit overkill for some home users, but always mm-hmm. that extra protection isn't going to hurt anybody. Nope. And of course, have antivirus and anti-spyware software on your computer that is always on and active scanning for threats. Yep. Make sure your operating system is up to date, including all the patches that the wonderful government puts out for us. Yeah, the operating system and any of your software, again, uh, is important to keep up to date. And do not access your financial accounts from public computers. So do not check your stock options at the library if possible. <laughs> yeah, it's just just some common Pretty simple things when you think about it, but sometimes you don't think about it. So having a little list in front of you might not be a bad idea, and that'll be included in the article linked in the description. On to headline number two. The important difference between cybersecurity and cyber resilience and why you need both. So we're talking cybersecurity awareness and the importance of security today, but there's another thing the author of this piece, Bernard Marr, reminds us is important to consider, and that is cyber resilience. So what's the difference between those two concepts, Andrew? Well, according to Marr, in a nutshell, cybersecurity describes the company's ability to protect against and avoid the increasing threat from cyber crime, while cyber resilience refers to a company's ability to mitigate damage and carry on once systems or data have been compromised. So that's a, a nice little nutshell explanation, but I'm sure we can break it down a little further. Yeah, so cybersecurity is basically stopping anything from getting in and cyber resilience is what you do if something does get in because you know no matter how great a cybersecurity setup you have there are so many layers and so many places that uh, something can slip through that unfortunately there's a still a possibility that you're going to get hacked right so think of cybersecurity like all the traps in home alone on the outside of the house and cyber resilience of being all the traps inside the house obviously mm-hmm. you have to be prepared in case of a breach and in a lot of cases today companies are starting to myth that cybersecurity is not going to be the the number one factor here it's not going to be the end all be all that's it's not a 100 percent sort of uh calculation yeah So you need your tarantula from your older brother, Buzz, to make sure that uh, you'll be able to recover from a cyber attack, I think is what you're saying. Yep. Keep the wet bandits out of your uh, Robin Hood (laughs) account. So Mar, in this piece, the cybersecurity strategy designed to minimize attacks getting through and resilience is to minimize the impact. So he's got some tips for how to approach cyber resilience if you haven't thought about it before. And it starts with working out where cyber events and incidents could have the most damaging effects on your business. So maybe draw up a list of uh, where your operations rely on technology and where sensitive and valuable data is stored and used. Right. Knowing where an attack is most likely to target helps you better posture yourself to sort of respond in the event of that attack, uh, if you know exactly where the stolen goods will be missing, then you can check there first. Right. And he introduces the concept of a digital twin. So that's a, a digital simulated model of your organization or its processes, which can then help you understand the impact on overall output and efficiency. So that's all kind of the preamble getting prepared for cyber resilience. And then then there are some specific steps he outlines. Right. So a lot of companies don't really have a plan in place if there is a breach. And, you know, at first sniff, you kind of think, oh, well, we'll just deal with it when it comes. But there are a lot of concrete factors that need to be hammered out in in case one of these events does happen so that you can respond quickly and, you know, appropriately. 
Mm -hmm. So basically a cyber incident response plan is what he's suggesting and develop offline emergency processes to keep essential functions running. So if you do have a breach, then you've got another way of handling customer service, quality assurance, finance, any other security while that breach is being addressed. And the response plan includes what needs to be done in the event of a failure or breach, who is going to do it, which is always important. Sometimes you have a plan laid out, but nobody wants to take responsibility for it. Right. Communicating the incident to stakeholders, how failures should be reported to regulators, how to assess and report the impact of resilience measures, so what worked and what didn't, how to get back to normal operations as quickly as possible, and one of the, the golden geese here, how to recover data if data has been lost or accidentally erased. Right, and the idea of cyber resiliency does promote the concept that no piece of data is totally safe, so even with things like message archiving, backups, all that sort of good and well, but there is always the possibility that a piece of data will just fly off the face of the earth completely, and you need mm -hmm. to know how to uh, recover from that or you know deal with its loss. Right. And so this follows on a lot of the big stories that we see over the years when it appears pretty clear that some of these companies and organizations do not have a cyber resilience strategy. I mean, the cyber resilience side of things, yes, it gets you back up and running quickly, but it mentions communication here. Mar mentions communication, which is vitally important too. That goes along with reporting and, you know, getting out in front of whatever the issue is. Everything that, you know, I think a lot of the situations where people don't report, they are just scrambling. But right. if you have it laid out and this is what I'm going to do, X, Y, Z, you're probably going to be in a much better position after a breach. Right. And this is when you start talking about things like the cost to the impact of your reputation. So mm -hmm. if you bungle the response to a breach, and you know, you could lose a lot of customers that way. You could really see your business pretty badly hurting. But if you do have a cyber resiliency plan in place and an incidents response team, you're much more likely to handle the situation more appropriately, be more transparent and uh, come out the other side with a still nice intact reputation. Yeah, people are willing to forgive in the, in the case of a breach or something of that nature if they still feel like you're on top of things. Right. And this is the way to not only be on top of things, but to show people that you're on top of things as well. Right. But if you just panic and sweep it under the rug and point fingers, then you know, people are going to start looking at you differently afterwards. <laughs> yeah. And you'll be in the news five years, 10 years down the road. Right. And I think the idea of cyber resilience is sort of making its way into the, the trending talk of cybersecurity because, you know, we talk about things like zero trust networks now. We're mm -hmm. at a point where we are recognizing as an industry that there is no, you know, silver bullet for cyber crime and we're going to have to also talk about the aftermath of when these attacks do happen because we can't stop them 100 percent now headline number three gov linked fatima cybersecurity career advert removed after backlash so you may have been able to figure out when I said advert that this is a British story. We've documented the shortage of employees to fill the ever-growing needs of the cybersecurity workforce, both here in the U.S. and abroad, and in this case abroad is the U.K. And the U.K. government or its proxy or something recently launched an ad campaign to try to attract career switchers. Right, so this campaign involved posters being placed all around uh, different tube stations, uh, depicting people from a variety of walks of life, with messages that says their next job could be in cyber, they just don't know it yet. So uh, sort of influencing people that may be in other job roles to think about a career in cybersecurity or networking or IT otherwise. Yeah, they wanted to get career changers. They weren't targeting kids in this case. They wanted adults who were in one career or had been in one career to switch. So one poster in particular came under fire and is no longer visible among the tube and bus stations in London and other cities in the UK. That poster depicted a woman who they called Fatima in the poster in ballet attire with that same message that Andrew just read. So the problem, many perceived it as a suggestion by the government that people involved in performing arts 
should, quote, get a real job or retrain for another career. Right. So there are some additional layers. First, the UK's Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sports, or DCMS, as well as the National Cybersecurity Center there in the UK, were connected to the campaign. However, the head of the DCMS has since come out to disavow the campaign and call this particular poster crass. Yeah, DCMS says the ad was from a partner campaign outsourced to tech skills firm QA, but the NCSC said the campaign was created by DCMS using NCSC materials. So keep up with all those acronyms that I just, uh, and abbreviations that I just threw out, then basically, in essence, it sounds like one department is blaming another department and is blaming then a third outside party. Kind of reminds you of this talk in the last headline we just had about pointing fingers and dodging the bike. <laughs> <laughs> so who is Fatima anyways? Uh, there's actually just a stock photo taken from Unsplash, uh, which is a site that licenses both free and paid stock photography. Originally, this photo was taken by a U.S.-based photographer in Atlanta, and the picture was a girl named Desiree at a dance studio there. Yeah, and the enterprising UK media tracked down the photographer, and the photographer had apparently been tracked down by some other people, too, after his campaign showed up. The uh, Twittersphere had let her know, surprisingly. (laughs) So she's quoted saying, I woke up Monday morning to a bunch of emails and tags, and I really felt devastated. I immediately thought of Desiree and how her face was just plastered all over social media and the internet. Different news articles and memes were created, and she had no clue. All of that really hurt me. Some people questioned if I knew and if I approved the use of my work. If I'd have known that this was going to be used in the way it was, I would have never agreed to it. Do they just make memes out of everything now? I think so, yes. All right. (laughs) The owner of the dance studio was also in the photo originally, but was cropped out for this particular advertisement. When being contacted and told of this story, they claimed it was an unforgivable act. Yeah, so very strong words here. Right. I mean... If you go back, stock photography is used all over the place. And, you know, once you decide that your photography is going to be on one of these stock services, you're giving up any rights to stop people from using it. Right. Uh, Especially a a free stock site like that. That's going to be well used by the time any one single advertisement gets around to it. Yeah. So the photographer in this case, you know, once it went to this stock service, There's no need to clear it, and it's very typical to use a stock photo like that in in an advertising campaign. But still, definitely people in the performing arts did not take this well. I don't think there was necessarily an intent there uh, to go after them because, as you said, there are a number of different versions of this poster that have people in all sorts of different career fields. I think there was a guy in a hard hat, and there's some other, other stuff like that too, but... You know, maybe a little bit more thought could have gone into this one. (laughs) Just a confusion of intention, so to speak. Uh, Maybe their next slogan will just say, please join us in cybersecurity. We're begging. (laughs) Yeah. But we love all of the things that you're already doing, too. Right, yes. Also, continue to follow your passions, but (laughs) we really need employees. And before we go, since we are closing in on Halloween, we thought we'd add one more special segment to this episode. Andrew, I thought we'd take a look at a few costumes we could wear for a socially distanced online costume party in honor of 2020. Oh, oh look. Here's one now. Do you, can, can you talk about what it looks like? Ah, yes. This is the coronavirus vaccine email costume hot this year. This is an interesting costume that's sure to turn some heads and get some wanted and unwanted attention. The world is looking for a safe, widely distributed COVID-19 vaccine to allow day-to-day life to return to normal. And this email claims that with a click of a button, you, your friends, your family, your loved ones can all get your hands on one first and free of charge. Oh, wow. Yeah. Funny I hadn't heard about any vaccine being approved for even emergency use yet, let alone produced large scale, but this email says it's true. And if it's too good to be true, it must be true. (laughs) It's even from the Organization of Healthy Worlds. Oh wow, that sounds official. The OHW. (laughs) 
All right. Well, uh, let's let's shop for another one just in case. So you, you always want to have a couple choices. So. Right. Of course. This one's a document result in a web search. So it, this is an interesting one. You don't hear about this one too much. When I search the career stats of my favorite NFL quarterback, Jeff George, one of the top results was this Word doc. There's probably some good info here about his time with the Colts, Falcons, Raiders, Vikings, Washington, and Seattle. Uh, he was on a lot of teams after all. Maybe there are some quotes or anecdotes mixed in with the numbers that would make sense to include on a document too. And it seems pretty official since it came back in the search results on a cloud hosted site. So it's probably worth a click. Wow, uh, yes. Seeing a document right there in the search results, that's handy. You don't even have to worry about a website. You just go straight to the part they ask you to download anyways. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's two choices, but I'm still, still not sure yet. So do you have a third one? Uh, I think I can come up with a third costume. Let's see. Uh, there's plenty of room in this next costume. You could even put some food in there and keep it long term. It's a smart fridge. Uh, one of the wonders of the Internet of Things. Don't actually climb into this refrigerator, please. <laughs> it can tell you what food and drinks you have inside and when you need to restock. Plus, it even has a nice little LED screen. Uh, it's hooked up to your Wi-Fi network, sharing bandwidth with your computers, printers, thermostats, security cameras, and more. And what could possibly go wrong with that? And scene. So, uh, well, listener, we know you're you're pretty savvy. So we're guessing you've figured out the common thread here. All of these costumes relate to malware or vulnerabilities, because that's what we talk about here on Thing. That's true. So the COVID-19 pandemic is still top of mind for many, uh, especially moving to flu season. So hackers are, as always, using social engineering emails like the one we described in this costume to get well-meaning, non-suspicious people to click on malicious links and download potentially dangerous threats. Yeah. And many train spotters know not to open. That's trained ED, not train spotters. The uh, the movie, yeah. <laughs> the uh, movie. <laughs> uh, know not to open a document attached to an email unless they're sure of the source. But how should people treat a search result that links directly to a document rather than a web page? Just the same. So just as in the email attachments, these documents may very well be a bad actor's ticket into your network with data exfiltration, encryption, and more all possible. And that goes for uh, Word doc, PDF, uh, a number of different file types. Just because it's on Google doesn't mean you should click it. No. And finally, our good friend, the smart fridge, nothing wrong with those in and of themselves. But with many of the internet or IoT devices that we talk about uh, and we're increasingly seeing on the market, they are not built with network security as the main goal. Hmm. Uh, smart fridges do come with some security updates, but those don't continue forever and uh, likely aren't getting updated as, as quickly as necessary. Mm -hmm. Plus, there have been documented cases of appliances like these getting hacked. So while you might think you don't have much of importance stored on your refrigerator, it does act as a gateway into your broader network uh, with lateral movements. So that is a foothold potentially for cyber attackers. Yeah, so a few different scary costumes. There are other ones that may be a little more high profile. You may see more people dressed up as a, a witch or maybe Tiger King this year. Barely remember that that happened this year, but uh, wasn't that like six years ago? It <laughs> feels like it. But these costumes could be scarier than any of the other ones. So the moral of the story is: don't fall for a good costume this Halloween or any time throughout the year. Treat everything with skepticism and keep your network secure. Right. Uh, any sexy witches or uh, smart fridges come? Make sure to take a second look. Yep probably be just as popular after they hear this podcast everyone's going to change their costume idea yeah i'm gonna to have to change mine because now everybody's gonna be a smart fridge <laughs> thanks for listening to this episode of ping a firewalls.com podcast and thanks again to james stanley of cisa for joining us check out the links in the description for more information about everything we discussed and remember that hashtag this month for Cybersecurity Awareness Month is Be Cyber Smart. Subscribe or follow now however you listen to ensure you get our latest episodes as soon as they're available, and please do rate and review us. Visit firewalls.com for all your network security needs and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn.
For Andrew Harmon, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll be back soon with another episode, but in the meantime, we remind you to get get secure, secure, stay stay secure. secure.